It is 9.32 a.m. on Friday, July 11th, 2008. My name is Steve Brown. We are in Blacklick, Ohio with Mr. Harry Busick. Mr. Busick, is that correct? That's correct. Can you spell your last name for us, please? Sure. It's B-U-S-I-C-K. And Mr. Busick, you're originally from Ohio? No. Where'd you grow up? I grew up in North Carolina. Where in North Carolina? A uh, little town called Edenton. Well, actually, it was Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. My dad was a Marine. And then uh, uh, my mother and father were divorced at, when I was 15, and my dad, my dad continued his service, and then he moved back to Ohio. And then it, later in years, he got to be in his late 70s. It, I eventually, after I retired, I wanted to be near my dad, so I retired up here in this area to be near him. So you grew up in a military family? Yes, sir. My dad's a retired Marine. Uh, he's a retired gunning sergeant. Okay. Where did he serve? He served in Okinawa. He served in uh, Saipan, mostly in the Pacific, uh, Saipan, and uh, I want to say American Samoa. Uh, he was in, with the second uh, FSR, which is a supply, I guess it's a supply unit out of uh, 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 Camp Lejeune. He was in supply logistics most of his career. And uh, what I remember, he was at Paris Island one time while I was growing up. I remember that. He got stationed there. And he, got, he was stationed, of course, most of his time was at Camp Lejeune. And so you grew up in Edenton, North Carolina then? Well, my high school years from there, from age 15 on till I became a man and was drafted into the military. Okay. I, I lived there in Edenton, North Carolina. Okay. And do you have siblings? I have. Uh, all of them are. Uh, actually, I was born later in my mother's life, so I, I have uh, what we would call half-sisters. Okay. My mother had three daughters, and uh, they all 15, 20 years older than me. Okay. And it was with, you know, her first marriage. Okay. And so you grew up in Edenton. You were drafted? I was in the Army? Yes, I was drafted in the Army. Matter uh, of fact, uh, I was at a point in my life when I was growing up and I was out of high school, I wanted to do something besides hang out in the little town I was in. Uh, I didn't have the, the opportunity to go to college, and uh, I decided to volunteer for the draft. I was the only surviving son, so I really didn't have to go into service, but I volunteered for the draft. And uh, the first 15 months I was in the military, I was... I went through basic at uh, Fort Polk, Louisiana, and after basic, they sent me to AIT in Fort Bliss, Texas, to be an air defense crew member on a what we call a Chaparral missile system, and they sent me to Germany and uh, the first tour, and then had an opportunity to get out after 15 months, but I didn't. I chose to stay in, and I made E5 uh, pretty quick. I made E6 pretty quick, and and uh, I moved back to the states. Uh, I think it was. Transferred back to the States at Fort Hood, Texas. No, I'm sorry. I was stationed, uh, let me look on these papers because I can't remember exactly. I don't want to get it right here. Let's see. I went back to Fort, uh, I went to F uh, Fort Hood and I was in Delta Battery, the first to 68 Air Defense Artillery, which is the first CAV division. And I was with them as an E6 squad leader and then after that I went to I served there until uh, the year 1975 and then I was uh, I got sent to bad duty station in Hawaii no, I was joking it was a great duty station I went with the uh, t I was with the 25th infantry division and I went to uh, C battery first to 62nd air defense artillery and where I served as a, a missile man or a, a squad leader and we uh, did crew drills. It was really, uh, we graded on crew drills. Our mission was, you know, air, to knock down medium flying, air, well, low flying aircraft. Uh, I guess it's not confidential anymore. Well, up to 1K, 2Ks, out, hit them out, knock them out. It was a tail chaser missile, heat seeker. And uh, we had to do crew drills on these things where we load them up on the launch rails. And we had a senior gunner set in the mountain. He's the one that actually took the commands from the squad leader at the fire, the missile engaged the aircraft. And then uh, 
we went to a place that was called uh, the Barking Sands Missile Range. It was in Hawaii. Uh, it's where we fired our missiles. Uh, I think that was, yeah, it was Barking Sands because the sand was so hot when you walked on it, it would actually bark. It would, boof, you know, when you, it was really, the sand was really hot. Never forget that. But anyway, and then plus, uh, after that, uh, I got kind of promoted. I, not promoted, but I didn't get a, a, a rank. I got promoted up into, uh, called Red Eye Missile System. It's a shoulder firing missile system. And I got promoted in that field an opportunity to go with the 2nd 11th Field Artillery, which was uh, right next door to the 1st to 62nd Air Defense Artillery, and they needed a red-eye section sergeant. So I went over there. I remember General Omar Bradley, uh, uh, well, that was his home unit. His, like his, I guess as a lieutenant, he served in that unit as a young man. And I remember him coming to visit us. Or, or something about that. I do remember Omar Bradley was uh, a part of that 2nd and 11th Field Artillery in, in the 25th Infantry Division. So you got to meet Omar Bradley? I, I saw him. I didn't physically get to, you know, shake his hand or anything. I got to see him. You know, I remember that. And uh, I was, uh, a, like I said, a section chief until uh, 1977. And that's when I got promoted. Uh, actually didn't get promoted. I got I decided I want to be an Army recruiter, or I didn't really decide. I think the Army decided they wanted me to be an Army recruiter, and they sent me to Louisville, Kentucky, DRC. And I was there a short while. Uh, I really didn't make it. I didn't. Uh, I. I didn't. I wasn't good enough. I, I well, I wasn't good enough. It wasn't just for me. So they they released me from that duty, and they sent me. I was only there three months, so they, they put me back into the, I went to the Fort Campbell, Kentucky, to the first, uh, 101st Airborne Division. That was, uh, I went in a combat support company, 2nd 503rd Infantry, and basically there I was still red-eye, and I was a red-eye section sergeant, and I was a part of that, that unit with combat support, and I really found out what the real Army was all about because we ran and we ran and we ran. PT was PT and PT and PT. I remember uh, I got really, uh, really good at running. I actually I, I really started really enjoying it. And I couldn't understand why I was such a good runner. Uh, after my father checked our geology uh, out, we found out that we had relatives that came over in the 1700s, or whatever, and moved into Maryland area, and they were messengers. So it was in my genes to be able to run long distance. But anyway. I, I really enjoyed that unit. That unit was uh, really gun ho. It was uh, uh, there was some recon. I remember uh, there was a recon platoon there. I was amazed at the the uh, the ath athleticism of these guys that would get out. They run faster than us. They would leave the whole unit and take off. We had division runs, which was like a big huge get together where we run in division runs and kids would wear masks on their face. The different you know like wolf uh, wolf mask was one unit. Uh, and uh, they had the guide arms, and they run around the units with the guide arms. And uh, I remember I had a kid in my section, his last name was uh, Private Carlisle. And it was a kid that uh, he really was really very athletic. And uh, I remember he had the record that he went to the air assault school there. And the air assault, he had the record for the road march, the forced, the forced road march. And uh, so it was a gun ho unit. And I remember the first sergeant, Bailey, he was a great, big, huge man. He was a he was a very uh, intimidating person. You just looked at him, you were scared of him. Or I mean, no, I guess not scared of him. You looked at him, and he had there was respect. He demanded it, and he got it. But he was quite a leader, and it kind of rubbed off on me too. I wasn't, I never got to be as big as he was, but you know, uh, it kind of rubbed off on me and being an intimidator too. After I got later in my career, and I after that, I got promoted to E7, and I had to move out of that unit. And, oh, I forgot to say, Colonel Pete Dawkins pinned my stripes on. He's a, he retired as a one-star general, I believe. And he was like the golden, golden child. He was a lieutenant. Uh, he had a picture on Life magazine of this guy. But he was our brigade commander, Colonel Pete Dawkins. Football hero from West Point all oh, that. Oh, yeah, and he drove a, I remember he drove a, a 911 Porsche. I remember seeing that car. And uh, I remember he, 
actually pinned my E-7 stripes on him and the uh, battalion commander. And my father was there for also. My father and mother came for the, my promotion to E-7. But that 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 uh, infantry unit was quite an experience. I also was fortunate enough to go to to Panama to Jungle Expert School. So I went through jungle school in Panama. Three weeks of intensive training, learning how to live in the jungle, learn how to repel, learn how to uh, d using flotation devices, getting dropped out of a helicopter into the water, uh, and just learn to. The, the foods you can eat and and different things like that, you know, in that training process. Plus, we did uh, recon, and uh, I guess with the infantry, we were a part of combat support. But we had a, a lieutenant. He was a he was Chinese or his background. He was very very good good in the woods and very good at reading a compass and a map. I was really impressed because we marched through the jungle in our training exercise. And he took us from one point to another point, and that point we had to meet a, a, a boat, uh, like a, L, I think it was low, um, LCD or something, L, I can't remember, load? LTZ, it's LZT. Not, I think it was, that's what we meant, we met that boat there. We were right on it, not even 50 yards off from where the boat pulled in to pick us up. And we went through the jungle at late at night, in the middle mm -hmm. of the night, all kinds of noises, sloth monkeys dr uh, jumping out of the, the, the Triple canopy is what it was, but that was quite experience experience in that that school, and uh, and also I had an opportunity while I was in that unit. I went to NTC. Well, not that unit. I got, when I got promoted to E7, I had to move to the first of the third air defense artillery. What's NTC? It's a national training center. It's out at Fort Irwin, California. They we went out and fought the Russians. Uh, it was a mock uh, war against. Uh, uh, op 4, which op, the Op 4 was completely dressed like Rus Russian soldiers. They had a Russian equipment, tanks, Russian uh, vehicles, and we actually went out in the desert and we played war games against these guys. How long did that last? Uh, that was, uh, I think, 30 to 45 day uh, times time period. So it was quite a bit. And, and I went to two of those rotations. What did you take out of that experience? Uh, you didn't want to fight in the desert. It was very, uh, very hard on your body because of the the sand and the and the heat, and the just the the air about it was just a thick air you had to smell, and and then not only that, it's just that the these guys from Op Four, it was like a real live thing going on, and it was uh, you know they actually had you know the fake rounds or the the blank rounds they'd shoot at you and the, and then they they'd shoot the tanks at you and they. They had smoke and all kinds of different stuff. It was just like a, a mop war, like a real war. And they kill you, they kill you. You know, they take your whole unit out. Uh, being in air defense, they always put us at the highest peaks or the areas where, like a, in a, in a uh, you're coming in a valley or something like that. Well, being an air defender, you want to be at the area where it, you could get the aircraft that's coming in to, to, uh, to get up on the, you know, to, to attack a, a convoy or attack one of your units. And that was our job, to protect those units from, Aerial, aerial attacks. Uh, so you wanted to be up on a high point, right, to accomplish that, right. So, and I, I was also uh, had the opportunity to work when I was in, in the first, first of third ADA. I was a, I didn't, I was no longer a chaparral missile man. I was a platoon sergeant in a towed Vulcan unit, and the towed Vulcan is a twenty millimeter gun that is towed on the back of a gamma goat. And it's actually, it, you know, it's a 20 millimeter gun that, you know, can really do some damage to, it can do d damage to soldiers or anything like that. And we used to joke about it. We don't shoot it. We weren't allowed to shoot at men. We, were like, we could shoot at uh, web gear and helmets and stuff, but we weren't allowed to shoot at men if <laughs> we got into combat with it. Uh, it it's, uh, so they positioned that, that Vulcan. It had a radar system on it that uh, used, utilized a far forward area uh, radar system. The FAR was a radar section that actually went out and tracked the aircraft and then sent the information back to us and all that stuff. But uh, I was a platoon sergeant in that and then also they I did so well in that battalion. Uh, I was trying to think of the guy's name that was uh, the battalion commander. I know it was a Major Berger that was a S3. He really liked me a lot because he he'd come out to my platoon and the, you know the training exercises and see how well we were prepared and 
how, how good we did in, in any of the field exercises. I mean, it's just my, my unit, my, my little section was always ready. We always did our job. And uh, I just remember uh, he saying, you know, I really would like to have you move to HHB as the platoon sergeant for the far. HHB is? Headquarters uh, battery. Sometimes I have to ask you to explain because our hope is that later on historians or somebody will be looking at this and doing right. research. So we have to explain terms sometimes. Right. Well, headquarters battery is what it was. I moved to headquarters battery which they had the forward area radar section there, and I became I was their platoon sergeant. They needed somebody in there that was going to make them do their job, and I was good at doing that. And I was good about taking guys that were com considered a loser. I made them learn to respect me and the unit, and, and, and I helped them do their job by saying, you know, you, you're going to be somebody. You know, you gotta, you got to be responsible for yourself. So... I, I took pride in changing those guys' attitudes. Now, did you have training to help you in that role, the leadership role? Uh, yes, I had several. Uh, I went through several training. Uh, I went. I was uh, when I was in Germany. Uh, my first tour, I was. I graduated from the NCO Academy, uh, non commissioned officers, non commissioned officers academy, and I went to that school, and then I went to some other basic leadership schools. Uh, throughout my career, army career, I went. Every time there was a leadership school or so, something to learn, I always grasp and try to get to go to the schools. As we talk about my thing with the FAR platoon, you know, the headquarters battery, I was in there and I realized that I hadn't re reached my potential. I had something about me that I really enjoyed, and I loved people. So there was a job that opened up. It called it was, it was a thing that came across. Uh, you know, I always look in the books and stuff and the little flyers they sent out for education. It's called Organizational Effectiveness Consulting School. OE OE school, which was out at Fort it was out at Fort Ord, California. It was a four month school. It taught us cons consulting skills. It taught us how to do assessments, how to do like what you're doing, interviewing. It taught us how to do group interviews. It taught us how to do workshops to to actually enhance and get the unit to to, to run better, to work better. So I did that for just about a year, I guess it was. It was, uh, uh, well, 81 is when I went, I graduated from that school, 1981, and, I, and, I, and 1982 is, I, I spent a year doing that. But anyway, I actually was transferred after I completed the school. I left the ADA unit from Fort Campbell, and I was transferred to Fort Ord for the four months. When I came back, they put me in, HHC, which is headquarters company, uh, uh, United States Army Garrison, Fort Campbell, Kentucky. So that meant I was under the division commander. And actually I was under a, the assistant division commander back then was General Ivy. He was a guy that carried a staff and smoked a cigar. I know, that's what I remember because I hate cigars. And he'd, he'd light it up, but he was a general. He knew what he wanted to do. I mean, I wasn't going to tell him not to, <laughs> that's for sure. But uh, I... We'd have meetings, like there was one place at Fort Campbell that we got all the, all the brigade commanders and battalion commanders and all the big, big shots, I call them. We got them together for a workshop, and I remember helping my major, the major I worked for at that time, uh, Reggie Yates was his name. Uh, I worked for him, and, and he had a cap, there was captain, and then there was an, a, a couple other captains, and two of us, E8s. We, we work with them, and we, we set up the, the, the workshop and the, the group to get things going, and, and we took notes and stuff, and then we compiled all that information and reported it back to General Ivy and the, the garrison staff and the general and all that stuff. So it, it actually, what it did was if you, if you worked in a dental, if you went out and did an assessment on a dental clinic, you would actually, a lot of the dentists get promoted up through the ranks. They never know how to lead. They never know how to manage people or things. They know how to clean teeth and pull teeth, do all that dental work, but they never learn how to, what their people want and do and all that. So I remember doing a Dentac, a dental, a big dental unit with a, was a, a full bird colonel there. And uh, we did work for him and he really helped, you know, he really was excited that we did it because it helped him get on board with his lieutenant colonels and his majors and captains and the staff there to get on board to see where he was coming from, what he, his expectations were and what he needed them to do to be successful in the dental clinic, taking care of the soldiers.
I have a, I have a question. You mentioned before that you took pride in your ability to motivate a kid or soldier who might be kind of a loser, motivate him to become a good soldier. How'd you do that? Well, I never asked him to do anything or any of them to do anything that I wouldn't do or I, I wouldn't show him how to do it. And basically, I, I, res I went to their level. I, didn't pro I, didn't, I, w I went to their level to talk to them. I didn't put my nose up in the air to them. I respected them. I knew, understood what they were going through because a lot of the soldiers, a lot of them didn't want to be in the military. Even though it was all volunteer service at that time because the draft was over with and Vietnam era was over with, you know, after I left Germany. Well, a lot of them, you know, they were into drugs and alcohol and they were doing stuff they shouldn't be doing. And, and I, just, I just, you know, led by example and showed them how great it was to be, be, uh, be the number one squad or, the, or, you know, lead the unit in whatever activity we might have. I know that one squad I was in, and I learned this from a, I forgot to tell you this, but I learned this not from, not just school. I learned this from a Staff Sergeant Kingwood. Willie Kingwood. He lives in Fort Hood, Texas. I don't know if he's still around. Love to see him. He had a great big huge smile when he smiled. He was a, he was a black guy, but he, he had a beautiful set of teeth and when he smiled he just, you know, and he always was a motivator. And I learned that from him because he had me as his senior gunner on the chaparral and he had another kid named Ford, a PSC Ford, that he had been, he should have been the same rank as me, but he had been busted in trouble. I remember him, but then there was another kid in our in our squad, and I can't remember his name. But we were kind of the loser squad, but we ended up taking the trophy down at the uh, for the uh, we got a ninety four point three three I think it was on our on our uh, evaluation, which was our missile firing at the island in the island of Crete, and this is I'm going back to when I was in Germany with that ADA unit. So our squad was number one, and that and. Uh, he had a way of doing it, so I used the same way. I, caught, I mimicked him. I did the same way. I put a boot in him, and I made him in a, in a love boot. You know, it wasn't a degrading boot. It just made him do their job, and I, I stayed on top of him. I kept a record of their, where they lived at. You know, I had a little book I kept. Back in those days, it, some NCOs did it, some didn't, some was faithful. I, I even knew the shoe size. I even knew the kid's shoe size. I even knew what size clothes he wore. I knew what state he was from. I knew his mom's name, his dad's name. I kept it in my book. So it's just, I mean, that was old school stuff that I was taught by older NCOs. And I'm sure it doesn't, I don't know if it exists anymore or not. But uh, I knew a lot about my soldiers, you know. I knew, I knew their needs. And, and I also got as much as I could out of them, you know, with respect. You mentioned that some of these guys had problems with drugs and alcohol. Did you notice changes from the time that you first uh, entered the military to the time that you retired? When did you retire? 91, 1991. Over that course of time, did you notice any changes in the kind of recruits who were coming in? Big change. In what way? Uh, a lot of them... And there's some positive and there's some negative in a way. But the, let me talk about the positive. The positive thing about some of these guys that were coming in the service, they actually missed, they wanted to have their mom and dad put a boot in their butt when they were young, and they didn't. They were silver spooned, I guess you might say, you know, protected, didn't, didn't have to do this, didn't have to do that. And uh, I guess that's the society the way it is. But some of these guys wanted you to do that, be very disciplined with them. They enjoyed that. They they. Excuse me, they respected that. But some of the guys that came in, I don't know how they got in the military. They couldn't pass PT test. They couldn't run. Uh, they did terrible on testing. Uh, I don't know if there was a standard of, the, the standard was dropped in the testing or whatever it was. But I, I, I mean, I, I didn't even have a high school education when I went in the military. I got my education later on through the GED, GED program. And I couldn't believe that I was smarter than some of these guys or knew more about books and math and stuff than these guys that had a high school diploma. So I don't know if it was an error we had there where they were just, you know, uh, it was like, uh, didn't matter, we'll give you a high school diploma, you just go on and go, you know, move on. 
Yeah. Or when was this time frame? That uh, you I want to say that kind of it was in the 80s. What was it? I, 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 the early 80s and the late 70s. Okay. And later on, what kind of kids do you get? Uh, they got better. They got better back in the, I remember, uh, I want to say 86 time frame, 87, 88, 90, up to the 90s. They got better. They were smarter. So Why do you think that happened? I think they lowered the standards at the, uh, in the, at the Army uh, production, I guess. I don't know, trying to get people in the service. In uh, the early 70s to no, mid-70s? Yeah, well, mid-70s you know, mid well, mid to the early 80s, I guess. And then later on they raised them up? I, I, I guess. I don't know. I'm, that's an assumption. Okay. I just noticed the difference because I know that uh, I, had more, I had more guys who were it was in my unit. I remember one of them was a college. He had almost finished college. Another kid, he was he was playing baseball in college, and he was a good, one of our better softball players. We had a we had a real good team with him. I mean, he could throw a ball from center field all the way to home plate, home plate. And uh, but he was a real smart kid. And but I just noticed that uh, the big difference. It was like maybe maybe it had something to do with the with uh, the army recruiting. I don't know. I have no idea if they drop the standards or not. What about the drugs and alcohol? That got, uh, I think the alcohol, it depends on where you were at. Like if you were in Germany, it was like a, a norm. Most people drank over there. So they go to these fests, they drink the, 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 you know, the German beer or the German schnapps, whatever. It's a whole lot more potent than it here, is here in the United States. Uh, I did have a few soldiers that we, uh, that I had to send to alcohol and drug programs. Uh, they were, uh, you know, they got themselves in trouble by being drunk on duty or whatever. But we, we, we sent them to drug and alcohol, and the drug and alcohol would set up a, a like a uh, workshop or not a workshop, but a what do you want? What do I want to use the word for? Uh, uh, not rehab, is it? Yeah, rehab. That's what I want. They sent them to Stugart to rehab. So one particular soldier is right during the Gulf War. His, his name was Tomlinson, P.F.C. Tomlinson. Great big guy. He drove a truck for a living before he came in the service. He came in the service later in his life, but he was a drunk. But, and I'm being, being the first sergeant, I, you know, I, took a lot of, I had a lot of respect for this kid, and I, I did everything I could for him. And, and I, I got him enrolled in rehab. It worked for him. He got back, he got promoted again, went back up in the ranks again. Uh, matter of fact, when the Gulf War kicked off, we had a uh, like a unit get together, and uh, and he had told my wife, "Don't worry about it, top." You know, they call first sergeant top. You know, don't worry about top because the first bullet comes, I'll step in front of it. There ain't nobody, and I'll kill whoever gets in his way. So he, you know, that's to me. He knew that I showed him love and I showed him respect, and I made him turn his life around. His wife was so so extremely excited about him getting into rehab and getting his life straight because he drank so bad. You know. I don't know what ever happened to him. I don't know if he changed or not. I know once you're an alcoholic, you're always an alcoholic. It don't go away. You just have to be a recovery and stay in the recovery process. Uh, Did you notice any changes in overall morale over uh, that time period? Uh, I think the morale, if I, if I could say, the, if I want to compare a morale from 1970 to 1991, the worst morale was in 1972, 73 time frame. Because we had people in the military that were drafted, and a lot of them didn't want to be in the military. And we had race riots. We had privates against the non-commissioned officers, against the whole unit, the whole establishment. You know, the, uh, they just didn't want to be in the military. And they, they did stuff like they set dumpsters on fire. They'd have riots. We, I was on guard duty one night, and I was ordered by a major to arrest 75 guys when they unloaded the M16. And I looked at him, I said, sir, you know, I'm telling you to get them all on the truck. You know, and I said, I, I didn't know what to do. I mean, I'm, you know, there's a couple others. We have unloaded M16s. But anyway, uh, a lot of these guys were court-martialed and kicked out of the military. Why, what were they doing at the time? Uh, basically, they were, there were in a lot of drug, drugs going on there. But I mean, at the time of this arrest, incident oh uh, they were burning they were setting uh, dumpsters on fire and what 
What prompted that? I have no idea. Where was this? This was in Giebelstadt, Germany. That was the first unit I was in. It was the end of Vietnam, rolling up. You know, Vietnam was getting ready. You know, it was being done deal, and and there was a few RAs, what we call regular army guys, that was in that unit, and they wanted to be there, but a lot of the guys that were in the unit were draftees. The draftees were not a lot of them, but some of them were like me. They stayed in and made it a career. But most of them got out. Uh, they were troublemakers. They were into drugs and alcohol. There was one guy in our unit that uh, we used to have helicopters fly in the middle of the night to do and with dogs to come in and, 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 and actually search the barracks for drugs, for hashies, is what they did back in those days. So it was bad. I was glad to see those guys going. That's when the military got better. When they got rid of that trash, those people, the military got better. Then when they made it an all-volunteer army uh, imposed by, I think it was General Westmoreland. And uh, even, you, could even have a, you could even drink a beer during lunchtime at one time. This was, I remember, but they banned that too, I think. But uh, Have you ever worked anywhere else in civilian life where you'd be allowed to drink beer at lunchtime? Any no. other employer? No. No. <laughs> no. Well, unless you were a German, they, they, they drink, they have a morning break and they have a, I mean, I spent 12 years over there, so I know I've seen them on the road, they get their little beer, and, but they weren't drunks, so they would just have a couple of drinks of beer or whatever. But uh, go back to ref uh, focus myself back on being with the, uh, the first of the third ADA, at, well, not first of the third, but HHC, the the division headquarters. After I left there, what when was this? In 1982. That was the end okay. of the 1982. I left there and I went to, back to uh, I went back to Germany, to A Battery, to the second and 62nd Air Defense Artillery, and that was in Germersheim. And Germersheim was a unit where, not a unit, but a, a, a town in in Germany where they stored all the reforger equipment, tanks, APCs, weapons. That's a, that was a storage area. You know, there was about 1,100 civilians worked there, and then we were an army unit, which was a, we were the, our mission there was to protect that area for air attack, in case it got attacked by airplanes, from Who's from airplanes? Czechoslovakia or Russia, really Czechoslovakia, I guess. We were seven minutes away by MiG. Uh, I, well, it might have been longer than that. I, I'm getting Giebelstadt. I'm, I'm, I'm getting excited here because I was in Giebelstadt. Before that, my first tour in Germany, and I forgot to mention this, this is where Gary Powers, that flew the U-2 spy plane, took off. And so I, I remember that. And also, Giebelstadt was, a, was an installation that was run by the Nazis. The Germans had that, and it was an underground, underground tunnel that ran from there to Würzburg that you could put two deuce and a half side by side to go mm. 30 or 40 kick, clicks. Deuce and a half is? The big, the, the truck, it's... Two and a half ton truck. It hauls troops, and uh, I don't know what the uh, probably 25 soldiers or 19 soldiers can sit in the back of it. But anyway, Gary Powers took off from there. But then at the end of the war, I don't know if you've ever heard this or not, but end of the war they never found this this base. And the way they found it, some of our pilots found it was there was the there was sheet painted on the runway, and they were all they were painted on the runway. And the pilot kept flying over there and seeing it, and he says, they're not moving. They're all the same place all the time. So they got lower, and they realized that that's what the, the Germans hmm. had done, painted sheep on the runway. It was a small air base there. Hmm. So I meant to say that. And there was, but anyway, I go back to uh, my second tour. Second tour, uh, and that was in Germersheim, where they, they had the refor kept the reforger equipment. There was an Alpha and a Bravo there, and we were... Uh, we were Chaparral, and also there was, uh, I can't remember if there was Vulcan there or not, the Chaparral missile system was there. And it was a small installation. We were the only active, uh, active duty Army unit there that I remember. Uh, and I do remember they had a lot of, always had dignitaries coming to that place. They had a great mess hall there. I remember the food was fantastic. I mean, that's, you know. I'm, but anyway, I remember uh, we had... Uh, Secretary of Defense, we had, uh, I can't remember the guy's name, but I remember we had, uh, what you call those guys that guard the uh, Secret Service. I remember seeing a guy was in the mess hall. He was grabbed his tray. He had two automatic weapons strapped to his 
uh, side here. I guess they were like Uzis or whatever. He was a guard for uh, or a Secret Service for one of the congressmen or senators or whoever was over there. I can't remember who was there at that time. And that unit was this is that unit was what put me into eventually into the first infantry division because we we were redesignated and we were sent back to the states and that's when I was sent to Fort uh, Fort Raleigh uh, and I made uh, let's see I made E eight list and I was with Delta Battery Second Battalion Sixty Seventh. Air Defense Artillery, and uh, I got a letter from a, my first sergeant there. His name was Cecil T. Fry, of, and uh, I'd be happy to share it with you. Sure. And, uh, show it to you if I can find it here. But he talked about, and I've gotten back to college now, and I, I checked spelling. You know how the new computer system is. He, his uh, spelling wasn't too good. But uh, he wrote a letter in here. It's really stuck with me. I was reading it last night. And he said, if when his son become of age to go in the military, he hoped that I would be his leader. And that made me feel good. And who was this from? His name was Cecil T. Fry. And I'd love to be able to find him if I can find a letter here. That's, that's from the brigade. Might be the last one here. There it is right there. It says, this is upon me leaving, I was... Uh, uh, Sergeant First Class Promotable, and I was in Delta Battery, 2nd Battalion, 62nd Air Defense Artillery. He says, upon leaving Delta Battery, he says, I wish to express my sincerest appreciation of your outstanding uh, con contributions of uh, keeping with Battery D, 267 Artillery, head and shoulders above the other similar type unit. During my assignment, your outstanding performance of a duty platoon sergeant has been noted by many. Every supervisor function inherent in your position has been accomplished in most th thorough and professional manner. Your ability to organize, coordinate, and supervise resources, both men and equipment, has, has been reflected by co cohesiveness of your platoon and its super ability to accomplish its mission. Words cannot, uh, I mean, words alone cannot express my appreciation for, your res for the respect, admiration, and devotion I feel towards you. I'll say, however, when that when my son uh, comes to f fulfill his military obligation to his country, I, I hope he will serve with a leader as dynamic as you. I could congratulate you on a job well done, and wish you the very best with battery, with the battery at Fort Raleigh, Kansas, and hope fortunate enough to serve with you again. And I mean, you know, I I drug this stuff out, and I couldn't believe I I had forgot about this, you know. I forgot about that. But this, that's, that was my life in the military. I mean, I, it's I a was, wonderful letter. It was a wonderful life. But anyway, after that, after that unit, I left that unit. I was, you know, I went to uh, Fort Riley, Kansas, and I was, made, I was made a first sergeant, which was called, a, I was flocked as a first sergeant. And I went to B Battery 267th Air Defense Artillery at Fort Riley, Kansas. And then after that, uh, to be honest with you, I got myself in trouble. How'd you do that? Well, I got, I always believed in taking care of soldiers. We went out on a field assignment. The brigade commander and the battalion commander, or what do you want, not brigade, but the battalion commander, the battery commander, and the, uh, the battalion sergeant major. We, have you ever been to Kansas? Yes, you sir. You ever noticed the level land there? Well, we drove up on there. He wanted us to get everything set up for a field maneuver. It was a field exercise. And who was he again? It was a, I can't remember his name. What rank? He was a colonel. No, not a colonel. My captain, the battery commander, wanted me to do it. He was going to leave and go with the sergeant major. And uh, I said, oh, no problem. And all of a sudden, a thunderstorm blew in, a bad one. And it was lightning. It was, and I grew up in the South. I grew up in North Carolina, and I've been out on boats, and I know exactly when thunderstorm hits and lightning hits, you get out of the area immediately for your safety. So I, taught, I told all the soldiers, stop what you're doing. They were putting up camouflage poles. I mean, a lightning rod. They had steel helmets on. Uh, they were putting up the kitchen and all that stuff. And I told my soldiers, I said, 
get in your vehicles, wait till the storm blows over. And when the storm blows over, we'll get it done. So we all went and got in the vehicles. And I guess maybe a good 30 or 40 minutes that went by. And then all of a sudden, the brigade, I mean, the battalion commander, the sergeant major, and the commander showed up. So they gave me a letter of reprimand because I did not get the equipment set up. I didn't do what I was told to do. And I said, sir, these people were in danger. I was looking out for their safety. And that's the way I've always been in my military career and in my life. I, I've always looked out for that other person, you know, and I, I didn't want any harm to come to them. And the lightning was striking bad. It, matter of fact, it hit a tree right outside where we had a mobile, it was called an MKT, which means mobile kitchen unit, I guess you want to call it. And uh, it struck a tree out right outside there while they was there. So, but, it's, but it's still, that was a blemish in my record. But I overcame it uh, like I always did. And uh, after I left that unit, uh, I mean, I stayed with uh, that unit. And I remember uh, that's when I had the opportunity. That, and then this was the best job I ever had. When I, that was the best opportunity I had. I got promoted, not promoted, but I got demoted from first sergeant to master sergeant. It wasn't, wasn't any pay Because off. of the reprimand? Yeah, yeah. So they, they actually relieved me. And I, I, they moved me to, to uh, I got an opportunity to work for the, the, the G3 sergeant major. And I worked in G3 when I was telling you about Major Smith was my, jo uh, my boss. I mean, these, and ma there was a Major uh, Hilton there. And I can't think of the name of some of the other guys. But they, I really enjoyed working there. They took good care of me. They cared about me. Uh, and I got, a, I got a medal from serving that year there, my last year there. I mean, I got a, what was called an ARCOM. And... Uh, and I and I also got some letters from those guys, but we were in the G. I was in charge of G, the G three NCOs. Which let me I'll tell you exactly what I did in that unit because it's on my EUR. And but I was a G G three operations sergeant, and uh, I got a max EUR from them, you know, report, and major uh, by Major Smith and, and and the other guy's name was uh, Colonel Cox, Alan R. Cox. And uh, he was a lieutenant colonel, and then, of course, we had a Colonel Sh Michael D. Schaller, but I don't remember much about him because, you know, he was was out of my, I guess, I was under the major and really. I didn't, you didn't have much contact with him. Didn't much contact with him. But, of course, you know, but I remember it says right here that uh, what the ER says, chief enlisted assistant to the chief G3 DP, which division, main, I guess you call operations and every aspect of division's activity, both in garrison and in the field, to include supervised training, discipline, welfare, appearance, activities of all enlisted personnel. I had about 20 to 25 people in the G3 section that was under me. Responsible for accountability and maintenance of all, uh, I don't know what MTO stands for, equipment. I, I think it's mission something, but I'm not sure. But I was the NCOIC of, of the Emergency Operations Center. And the D-Main, which is the division main center, which is the headquarters, or the D-Main is the, the system that they put outside with the expando vans, and they put the division headquarters in there to run the battle when we go to combat. I supervised the routine operation and maintenance of the plan, plans and operations faci uh, facility, coordinate and sign operation detail missions throughout the division. And then it talks about also some stuff that they were impressed with me because I... I on several occasions, I provided the, the first ID domain to the 35th ID M, and it's Kansas Army National Guard. So I got the opportunity to go out and train the National Guard on our domain and our, you know, our, our setup and stuff, while the officers above me were training in the, the mapping, the G2 stuff, and all that other stuff, you know, with, the, with a battle, with a, a mock battle. Uh, and this was in Fort Worth, uh, Leavenworth, Kansas, where I had to go to from Fort Riley, Kansas. And we go up there on a, But anyway, it talks about the high praises of uh, my actions and things like that. And then also the, the G3 uh, guy, he recommended that I be promoted to Sergeant Major and uh, even to Command Sergeant Major and attend the Sergeant Major's Academy. So I guess my bad thing, the bad thing that happened, I was overcome by this, this guy. And, and I did my job, and I did my job before, but sometimes t uh, personalities don't get along. Sometimes alikes, people who are alike don't get along. 
if you know what I'm trying to say. And I think that might have happened in that unit because my commander and I, he was really hard-headed, and he didn't want to listen to anything I had said. He wanted to be in charge of everything, and he didn't want to do. He didn't want the first sergeant of the unit to run the NCOs. He wanted to run the whole thing. And it had been a whole lot easier if he had let the first sergeant run the, the enlisted guys and him run the officers, but he didn't want to do that. And uh, I, I mean, I don't think bad about it. I just think it's a learning experience. I mean, I think you have to go through some blocks sometimes. But I learned from that, and I, I moved on. I went to, I went to uh, G3. Then after I, I left uh, the 1st Infantry Division, uh, I went back to Germany again. <laughs> and How many I was, tours in Germany? Uh, I, I, three? I think it was three tours, yes, sir. But I went back to Germany again, and this time I went back to Germany as a 1st Sergeant. And, uh, and when I went back to Germany as a 1st Sergeant, I went into Hawk Battery, which is Hawk Missile Unit. Mm -hmm. And they're medium, air, they're medium missiles. They fire at medium aircraft. And that's when I got the Czech border. We were seven minutes from the Czech border. And the, the, the place was in, uh, I want to say, uh, Swineford, Kahn Barracks, Ledward Barracks area. We were first at Ledward Barracks, and they moved our whole barracks over to Kahn. And then our, our missile site was out at range control, which was uh, off the backside of, uh, of the range where we had our missile site. And we were, you know, our, our mission there, we were under NATO, so we were evaluated by TAC evals. It was a very, very, it was a very, very strenuous, hard job, I mean, being the first sergeant and keeping everything, uh, uh, everything in order there. Because I know, I remember we had a, we had a double line fence. We had, I had MPs that worked for me that guard the gate. The only way you could get on our little installation was you had a need to know. You had to be on the access roster to get on there. I don't care what rank you were. Because uh, I knew I had a, the, uh, the community colonel came down to get on the site, and one of my MPs wouldn't let him on. They called me down the gate. And I said, sir, you can't come on the site. He said, well, I'm a colonel. I said, I can't help that, sir. You can't come on the site. And I gave him our general's name and everything, and he called him. And the general complimented me on we, us doing our job. He has no need to be on that site. He has no access. And then, so anyway, we had a double line fence. I guess it was 12 feet. And then we had our, our, our we had a, uh, we were actually under 24-7 um, radar guys, scope, that were watching the scopes. We had, a, a, I guess you call it TCO officers, TAC officers, that were watching the, the radar scope, and it was a 24-hour manning. And uh, 365 days a year, and we had our own. We had a mess hall there. We had a motor pool there, and we had all our our missiles were in different pad areas. And we had uh, we had crews that were responsible for you know getting those missiles on the you know to fire them off the launch rail and shoot down enemy aircraft if, if they came across the border. And then we had. And again, who would that be that you were looking for on the radar? It could be. It could be the Warsaw Pact. Could could be Czechoslovakia. It could have been. Uh, it could be any part of the Warsaw Pact back then. It was called the Warsaw Pact, Russia, whatever. What was your perception of the reality of that threat, the potential that that might happen? It was real because I know we did have an air, we did have one of their aircraft sneak across to, on us. I remember uh, we were ordered to shoot it down. What happened? It, the missile didn't fire. Something happened. I don't know what happened. I I don't I don't remember. I. And it was before I got there. It was just a, it was not while I was in charge. It was something that happened maybe a year or so. And it might have been a, a urban legend, too. I don't know. You know, <laughs> I just know that they said, yeah, we were ordered to fire, and the missile didn't go off the launch rail. So, wow, that's scary. But as far as you were concerned, it was very real threat. It was a real threat. We, our, our perimeter, the real threat we had in, in our perimeter, outside of our perimeter, would be, you know, different groups, maybe uh, fascist groups or something that may wanted to, to do harm to American soldiers. I mean, German we, civilians. Yeah. Or yeah, yeah. So we wa we watched out for them, and we watched out. You know, we just we were we were serious about guard, and we even had in the double line per perimeter, one of the general officers or somebody I don't know who it was. I can't remember the name that caused this, but we had geese that were our guard dogs. We had geese in a double line fence that went around the perimeter. We had to keep feeding water for them. And I used to get so angry because 
we get a veterinarian come out there and the water's dirty so they get they fail us on the inspection I mean come on a geese is going to drink a little bit of water he's going to step in the pan he don't know so we had if we didn't keep it for the water fresh and keep the food fresh they we failed the test so eventually we complained so much to congressmen and senators and the, everybody God knows who we complained and finally we got rid of them so let me understand this you had the high-tech radar yeah, that was for searching the skies. Yeah, for, yeah, and at the same time you had geese guarding your perimeter. Yeah. Have you ever been around a goose, though? Oh yes, sir. They are very, very, very. They will let you know on a farm. They'll let you know if somebody's coming on the property. It's not supposed to be. Oh, there. absolutely. So they, they all, you know, if anybody got near there, they would actually, burr, 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 you know, and uh, I used to feel sorry for them because we had some mean people that were working there, and I get, and I, this was another, I guess, it might be an urban legend too, I guess, but. I remember kids talking about, yeah, every time I got a chance, I'd throw the radar on him. I'd fry him. Oh. You know, but it didn't do any good to him anyway. I mean, it, but, but I remember that eventually we got rid of the geese, which was a big headache. And then we went back to doing our job. But the tack of owls, we got graded by NATO. There might be a, a Belgium, a German, uh, Netherlands evaluator coming to evaluate us. And uh, we get to meet some of the, our NATO brothers and sisters, I guess you might say, and they were pretty tough. And uh, th these tack of owls, would, sometimes they'd go, well, they would go 48 hours. You wouldn't sleep for 48 hours if you're in leadership. I remember when I, was, I was not sleeping. We, we did Mop 4 for training, you know, where the whole Mop 4 for chemical biological warfare. Uh, it's Mop 4. It's a suit that you wear to protect you from, uh, you know, chemicals uh, or, or nerve agents. Or you know what was that like? That was terrible. Why? It's the it's uh, you have a mask to wear and you got the rubber gloves on. You got the heavy suit on. It's got charcoal liner in it. It was it was really hard moving around, and maneuvering. And you have your weapon, your web gears on that. And you got your steel helmet. You got your helmet on. And and we had women in the unit, so it was you know in that Hawk unit there was women soldiers, and uh, it was hard on everybody, really, to tell you the truth. But you'd have to wear that sometimes as long as six, seven hours, eight hours. And, and the mask you'd wear sometimes two or three hours. You uh, mentioned that you had women in the unit. Uh, when did you first become aware that women were having a more active role in the military? Uh, I guess it's when I took over that unit as a first sergeant. Because we had, uh, they weren't allowed to have any, what do you call it, combat. Uh, positions, I guess, be on the front lines, but they were allowed to, to get into the air, air defense artillery. But I tell you, I had some good soldiers. I, I remember her. She was my uh, training, uh, not training, she was my clerk, my battery clerk. Her name was Specialist 5, Roseanne Acosta. Roseanne, or Roxanne, I think it's Roxanne, I believe, Acosta. She's a civilian in Florida right now. She's a GS-12. So she had got out of the military, continued her education, and she's a civilian, but, and she, uh, she was very, very thorough, very good worker, and uh, I mean, very, I mean, she was my, she was my right arm. She kept me in line. She proofread all paperwork we had going out of there. She kept us in line. But I was aware of the, the soldier thing with the, the female soldier and the male was when I took over as a Hawk Battery, Hawk Battery First Sergeant, because before I was in infantry units or, or like, you know, the first ID infantry unit and the, the job that I had, I had women soldiers there in, the, in G3, but there really wasn't as many as there was in the Hawk unit. Okay. What sorts of problems did that create for you, or challenges, I should say? What sorts of challenges did that present you as a leader? Well, we had some that I had to actually, I really had to get rid of. They weren't really... Um, I, I, I won't say her name, but I remember her. She was uh, she wouldn't get up in the morning. She wouldn't go to work. She just a malingerer. She wasn't doing her job. So we had a chapter. She didn't want to be in the military. We chaptered her out. Not unlike the people you talked about earlier. Yeah, not unlike that. And it was, it was we had the same problem with males too, but it was more identified because well, something that she had done to me. It, I, I remember. She got in trouble. The commander gave her an Article 15, and uh, what's an Article 15? It's uh, it's like a, 
a speeding ticket <laughs> okay or a, a citation for a, from a police officer we get our article 15 you got to go in front of the commander and the commander actually you know he reads you your rights and all that stuff and if you want to take it fine you know agree to it then he'll go ahead and proceed and he had a maximum amount of punishment he could do for you and he, if you were really bad he'd max you out well, what he did he didn't I don't know if he really maxed out I know he gave her seven days of extra duty which they reported to me they closed the business around five after my formation at five o'clock around 530 in the evening they reported to me and I put him with it with the uh, well he had a uh, NCO that had was the barracks in charge of the barracks at night and he was, he was our duty NCO and uh, I had a rake and leaves and I did it at, you know she was raking leaves and that was her punishment part of her punishment in the front of the barracks getting the leaves picked up and the, the wind was blowing so she'd rake the wind blow the leaves back and I was watching her out the window laughing like crazy so anyway I went on and she complained about it. she couldn't get it. I said just do the two hours and don't worry about it and she was supposed to leave that morning fly out that next morning because she was and be, she was going to be escorted to the, the, the Frankfurt airport and put on a plane and then she's going to be getting out of the army that was her last day so anyway I guess she had a party the night that night. She bought Budweiser, and 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 there was a, a that morning they had taken her to Frankfurt at 4:30. So when I got in at 5:30, whatever 5:15, uh, she was already gone. And I looked on my desk, and there was an empty box, a beer, I mean, you know, a Budweiser box. And I opened it up, and it was full of leaves. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, "Oh, she got me, didn't she?" But then I picked up the phone, and I called. Frankfurt, Ryan Main, and I talked to an MP there, and they got me to the right person, and they held her back and said, you're not going home. You're going back to your unit. And this was a joke, right? Because I, no, I had no authority to do that. But anyway, I told her, there's something going on. We have to stop her from leaving the country. She needs to be brought back to the unit. Can you help me out? And one of the NCOs that I talked to was an MP there. He said, no problem. Stop. We'll, we'll, we'll scare the heck out of her. They did. They had her in tears and everything. I said, so I figured I got the last joke on her. <laughs> but uh, uh, but what I, was your overall impression of women in the military? I thought they were great. I mean, my overall impression, I thought they were great. I think that they make the guys work harder. Why? Because they're, they're I don't know what it is about them. They, I guess they're trying to be going to be a flirtation thing or a flirty thing. Or I mean, the gals over here are working hard and, the guys over there trying to get to know her, so he's going to pitch in and start working hard too. I guess I don't know. I don't. I, I know that uh, in the you, Hawk unit, you know that we had some, we had some good, good uh, workers, and most of them were. I had some MPs. Most of the females I had were MPs. They guarded our uh, site. I never had any problems on them. I remember one. Uh, she looked better than a, a male when she was in her fatigues. I mean, she her spit shine boots. I mean, lines, creases in her, and, you know, just, she looked sharp. Did you notice any, did it create any particular disciplinary issues for you to have women? Well, there's, I can go back and talk talk to you about, not me in particular, but a, 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 a guy that I knew that we went through the military together when we were at Fort Campbell. Uh, he, uh, he had a problem in his unit. Uh, with a female soldier and a, and a male soldier, they were on guard duty together, and this was at Fort Campbell, and they both got into poison ivy somehow, and it was both on their private. That so was kind of hard to explain, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> so I have no idea. <laughs> okay. Can I ask you some questions? You've, you've mentioned a number of these uh, missile systems that you worked with, and I'd mm -hmm. like to get some knowledge about that okay. uh, recorded. Can you tell me about a chaparral missile system well the chaparral missile system was uh, it was a system that was actually on a it was a like a APC but it wasn't it was like an ammo carrier for the uh, 105 Houser, uh artillery unit and it was it was like a shell and then they put a the missile system was like on a platform it was on a, it had a pedestal that would raise up and down and there was a like a, a glass compartment in there matter of fact I have a picture of one, I believe. That's the Hawk there. Why don't you turn that around and we'll yeah. get that on the... Yeah, that's the Hawk missile there. So that's the Hawk missile that you've uh, been referring to. Yeah. Okay. And then... And then I can... You got it? And then I'll get... Uh, let me show you a picture of the Chaparral here. 
you forgot if I can find it here. I fired a chaparral. I fired, here's one right here, but that ain't a very good picture. I'll find a better picture. I fired the chaparral four times. Uh, I was a senior gunner, and that Willie Kingwood, I was his senior gunner, and I hit the target. We shot it like they were called bats, and they'd have rocket motors in them. They'd go out in front of our screen, and we'd, we'd engage them and shoot them down. And that was off Bark, um, Barkin Sands Missile Range. In Hawaii. You know, yes, sir. In Hawaii and Germany, we were in Greece. And I can't remember the name of that. You know what? I think it, I got it mixed up. Well, no, Greece was the island of Crete. Crete. Crete, yeah. You mentioned Crete early. Yeah. How many? How many? Uh, Four missiles. What was the size of a crew on a chaparral? Uh, well, it was five man. And then they made it to four. They found out we we could work with four people. What were the functions? We we had to do uh, missile checks. In other words, what we had to do was they had coffins that that had four. Well, like the the back of the, here's a picture of the chaparral there and that, that pedestal right there. I don't know if you can get it or not. I was hoping I'd had a better picture. But it's a mobile device. It's mobile. It's a track vehicle. And, okay. Uh, so what did the four guys in the crew do? Uh, what we did was we'd go to a site, you know, in an area where we were going to defend a certain perimeter. We'd have a, a mission, like we'd have 180 degrees, you know, like our south and north, depending on the degree we have. And that's our, our area we were responsible to defend against low-flying enemy aircraft. And the missiles weighed around 190 pounds apiece. And... Uh, you got you had uh, four on the launch rail, and then uh, you could also had the, the capability of carrying. Uh, I want to say eight more. Yeah, eight in coffin. They were we called them coffins. They they were in the storage area on the back side of the. Can we just hold on a second, and then we'll pick this back up. She's got to change tape. Okay, good. I can find my stuff yeah, here. Yeah, you go ahead and find your picture of chaparral. Chaparral missile there? Yeah, I, I don't know if you can get this or not, but this is a night firing of one. And you can see the missiles on the uh, on the launch rail, and you can see the one with the smoke right there. That's the one that's, that's taken off. I had opportunity to fire. I fired four times. I was a senior gunner, and I fired uh, four missiles, and I hit my targets every time. And what's the picture above that? And the picture above this is the shoulder firing uh, stinger. Or no, I don't know if that's stinger red eye. Let me see, make sure. Now, this is the red-eye missile because Stinger took its place. It was the same thing, but Stinger had the capability head-on where this one's a tail chaser. And, and when you say tail chaser, you mean heat-seeking? Heat-seeking after the, it goes after the tail of the aircraft. Okay. Whereas the Stinger took the place, and the Stinger had the head-on capability. So you've got a four-man crew on that chaparral. What are the four jobs? Well, the four jobs, like you'd have one inside, one is inside this area right here as a senior gunner. He's the one pushing the, the buttons to make that missile fire off. Then you have the squad leader, which would be in the back of the vehicle about 200 meters away with radio. And he's the one that's acquiring the target and, and giving you the command to engage on the aircraft to the senior gunner. To the forward of the vehicle is a is an observer. He's an observer to watch out for aircraft also. He's 200 meters out. And his job was to fan and keep an eye on the aircraft. And the, and the other guy, he could be at either one, with the squad leader or with the, the forward area. Uh, but the responsibility of setting this vehicle up, they camouflage them, put camouflage nets on them, hide them. And, uh, it's, you know, and, you, and you're, you have to observe aircraft. You have to be with your binoculars and stuff like that, watching out for aircraft. Now, well, who's responsible for sighting that thing in on the target? The The... The senior gunner that's inside the, the okay. canopy, I call it the canopy. It's like a, it's like a vehicle, like a jet airplane. You know, a canopy on a jet airplane was basically mm -hmm. the same principle. It's a canopy and it's closed area, and you sit in a seat like an aircraft, and you have handles that would, you know, you could turn them to, to make the the mount itself circle around, and then. Uh, You make them circle around, and then, uh, and then after that, uh, you know, there's buttons on there. There's a fake button. They say it's on the handle. You push the button. They're firing the firing buttons when you engage the aircraft. There's a toggle switch you had to flip up 
the, the, the arm, the missile system that's on the launch rail, and then you had buttons that are on those handles. So one's a fake and one's a real button. And the reason it is because, you know, you push, you know, with your hands, then you're going to hit the firing button, whatever. And then it takes, it seems like forever when the, the missile comes off the launch rail, you're sitting there as, as a gunner, you're sitting there, and you're going, I, I fired, what's going on? And then all of a sudden, it goes, about, about three seconds, it's off. And a good 700, 800 foot out, it's doing Mach, a good Mach 2 plus, Mach 3. It's, it's booking. It's, it's very, very fast. Now, let me ask you about the red eye there, that shoulder held. Is that normally, you've got three guys in that picture. Is that a normal red eye crew? No. The, 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 one of these guys is an evaluator. And one, he's, he's uh, and the other guy, they got a gunner and you got the, you got the squad leader usually. But this is an evaluation scenario here. And this missile system here, actually, when you pop, when the thing pops out, you fire that missile off your shoulder. It actually, it's got a, like a, just a, rocket motor that sends it out so many feet and then it's got a booster it kicks in and then it goes after the aircraft so it's just one man it's a one man yeah but you have a squad leader giving the pfc that's what a lot of the air force pilots used to hate about us is because we've got a private e3 he can knock down a multi-million dollar aircraft with a missile on its back and these are very dangerous if the if uh if that system ever got in the hands of terrorists we'd be in a lot of trouble because they can make they could put us in a lot of, they kill a lot of people. Uh, and then, uh, I wonder now, what's the range on that? I don't remember. I think it's. Do you remember what it is on a chaparral? It, well, I used, I hope I'm not giving you classified information, but it's, I think the, sh the chaparral's low altitude, and so is the, the, the stinger, or not stinger, but the red eye is low altitude. So we're looking at 1K, 2Ks, maybe. Five to six Ks at the max. Kilometers? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, and then whereas the, the Hawk missile system is medium range, so it goes out miles. It, I mean, the Hawk, you actually see it on the radar, the aircraft flying on the radar screen. You don't even see it by eye. With, with these two systems, it's you, you apprehend the aircraft visually, and then you sight it in. Right. Right. With the Hawk, it's strictly a radar thing. Right. Yeah. Now the other one was the Vulcan, the Vulcan gun right here, which you, you can see the gun. It looks like it's, it's like a right here. It look, looks looks like a Gatling gun, and it shoots 20 millimeter shells, and it has a radar on it also. And the locking device is, is when it's tracking an aircraft, it can lock in on that aircraft and then shoot at it. What is it shooting? It shoots 20 millimeter uh, rounds. Okay. And they're about they're about six to eight inches long, about, I guess about an inch and a half, two inches diameter. So that's a low range? That's also low range. Also, this weapon was used in Vietnam. Urban le legend, I don't know if it's, I mean, it was told to me by other NCOs when I was a young private. They took this weapon into Vietnam and they put it on boats that were going in down, down and they kept it covered. And at night they uncovered it. And if they were attacked, they let, they ripped it right because it would fire. It it uh, you put it on a hundred you put it on hundred round burst, ten round burst, thirty round burst, or hundred round burst, or no limit burst. So that thing would rock and roll. It fought, it sounded like you ever you ever gone out and heard bullfrogs? You know do you know they're the big ones? This is louder than it sounded like a bullfrog, but it was louder than a, a big bullfrog. What was it? Capacity, how many rounds could it shoot before it ran out of? Well, it had to be reloaded. I can't. I don't know what the, what the, how many rounds it had in it. I can't remember. Uh, if you back, if you had a towed Vulcan and you backed up, you had a towed Vulcan up to the back of a Gamma Goat, you could load probably two or three thousand rounds. Okay. But on the, the, the SP, which is a self-propelled, uh, the, the track vehicle, I don't, I would say three or four hundred rounds maybe or five hundred rounds. I don't know. I can't What's remember. crew size on a, on a Vulcan? Uh, they were four, four-man crew. What are the functions? Their functions are basically the same thing. They had a forward observer out with a radio out of 312, out 200 meters, and then in the back, the squad leader would be in the back 
same the same scenario setting up. Okay. Uh, How about the big Hawk missiles? The Hawk missile took. Uh, oh man, I. Now those are not mobile, correct? Because they, you're building these big perimeters around them. Well, they 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 can be mobile. They can be put on trucks and taken to a to an area, but they're as for. The ability compared to the the low air defense system, no, they're not as mobile. Uh, they're 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 actually on. A, they can be put on a truck, and that's why they put them on on a on a like a big huge five ton, would would carry these missiles. And I'm trying to think the number of crew members, because I, I think you had a lot. I think it was I, know, I think it was seven or eight guys. I can't re I can't remember. Because, see, at the point where I got with Hawks, my job was to make sure they did their job. I, I didn't really get involved that much in their crew drills. You weren't so much over one battery as? Yeah, as a squad leader or, or a platoon sergeant. Uh, Can I ask you a couple questions? Let me ask you some questions about uh, First Division. Okay. You, you've told us what your impressions were of 101st. Yeah. What were your impressions of the first division? I liked the first infantry division. I thought the first infantry division was uh, had a lot of history. You know, that's what I liked about it. It was. I, I remember the horse chieftain. Uh, I guess I guess his name was chieftain. I can't. I hope I'm right. But the last cavalry horse was buried at Fort Riley. My understanding, he was buried standing up right near the flagpole. Do you know about that? Is that? I don't. I don't know anything about that. Don't anything. They um, want to check on them, and the museum they have there. I went there and I was impressed because they're 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 also they're trying to keep the buffalo alive. They have arranged that buffalo are allowed to roam out there, real buffalo, you know. The, at Fort Riley. Yeah, Fort Riley. Uh, How did you learn about this history of the division? I guess some of the stuff I read and some of the stuff that you know, like we'd have classes sometimes that our bosses would be talking about. Uh, I remember my dad, I guess my dad, because my dad, being a retired Marine, everywhere I went, my dad and stepmom would come to visit us, no matter where I was stationed. And I always took him to places like that because he really, he really enjoyed history and, you know, what units did in the military. And, uh, and he just got a big kick out of going on a military base, being a retiree. And uh, he still, when we moved here to... Uh, Columbus, we still, he wanted to go to the right path to the Air Force Base to get groceries and med medicine when he actually could have got it here, but he wanted to go up there. But, I mean, you know, he saved a little bit of money. He won't anymore with the price of gas. But my father passed away at age 86. I lost him a little over two years ago. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and if I had thought about it, I've got some of the pictures of him back when he was in his, in, being in the military. So if you ever want any of that, I've got an album of it. The um, what would you say? Just give me an overall impression of what military life meant for you, or how it impacted you. It impacted me. Uh, I worked with people who cared about me and my family. Uh, we were a team. We watched each other. We learned to watch each other's back. It was. It wasn't profit and loss. It wasn't about money, like it is out here now, where I work. You know, where I was working in retail. It's all about profit and loss. If you're not making money, you're a nobody. Or you're not doing your job or whatever. But it. And there was more teamwork. It was more caring about each other. And I mean, if somebody got hurt, we cared. If somebody was having problems, we cared. We. Or we had an, an ultimate goal to do something, and we all worked at that goal to do it, you know, whatever, the, whatever the, the mission might be. I guess it's just that it wasn't because of money, because, I mean, I really wasn't getting rich from it, or, I mean, I was making a decent living at, as I got to be a senior NCO. But I just, I just, and then the friendships that I had. It's just a different type of friend. Uh, it was, I mean, you know, you live in government quarters, but in your neighbors, you're just, when when you're going off somewhere to the field, you, 
You talk to your neighbor, says, hey, I got to go, and don't worry about your family. If they need anything, you know, tell them, come over and see me. We'll, we'll see that they blah, 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 and, you know. That's the way they were. That's the way the military was. They even designed family uh, like the commander of a unit if he had a wife or if he didn't have a wife, they would pick somebody that was senior in the unit, a wife, to be in charge of the, a sp she'd be the spokesperson for the unit and she'd be the point of contact if, in case something was happening. You could call that, that, our wife could call that wife to find, you know, say so-and-so had her baby or, or so-and-so is in the hospital or and it was just a, uh, just a different uh, environment. It's just, I mean, it's something I'd love, and I know I'll never get it back. I would love to f work for somebody or some company that had those ways about The it. values. That the values that we had. Uh, you got rewarded for doing a, jo a job. You ne there was no negative. What I, I remember, compared being out here in, in the civilian world and working for a company, the companies I work for, uh, there was always, you never could do enough, you could never be good enough, or you never could do enough to satisfy them. Well, in the military, it wasn't that way. No matter what you did, if you accomplished the mission, you were always complimented on the job that you did for them. And you got letters, I've got stacks of them from guys that I work for that appreciated me doing a job for them. And I haven't changed my way of thinking or my way of working. I'm the same guy that I was younger than I am now, but I've never gotten that since I retired. Do you think your mission was more clearly defined or the expectation was more clearly defined in the military? I think so, yeah, I agree. Did that help? That helps. When you sit down, I expect, you know, just like you've told me what you expected me to do here, you know, and I, I you know, uh, you give me an expectation, you know, and what, what you expect me to say and do or whatever, you know. Uh, I, I, I agree with that, yeah. I, I think that was better defined. And that was, that was the whole point about me being an organization effectiveness because I was able to help units do that, you know, define what they were supposed to be doing, define what maintenance programs they needed, define what uh, the soldiers were looking for you as a leader to do for them. So you're right, never really... Never thought of it that way, but it. You mentioned a Sergeant Major Vincent DeSantis earlier. Yeah. He's a, he was the old, well, out of all the Sergeant Majors I had, this guy was a, a people person. And, and, I, and I got a, I have a picture of him here. He's a, he was in combat. He was with Dusters. He was with Quad, I'm going to say Quad, well, here it is right here, Dusters. Uh, their 40 millimeter gun, and this is him as a young staff sergeant, and I think that was taken when he was in Vietnam. I don't know if he's still living or not, but his name is DeSantis. He was at Fort Riley. He was my first sergeant major guy. In the 1st Division. 1st Division, yeah, in that ADA unit. And uh, he wasn't there long. He, I think he got, he, was, he served a year, and he, he actually retired, I believe. He went ahead and went, went to retirement. Uh, did you get it? The thing about him was... Uh, he was a, he talked to you. He picked at your head. You know, he, uh, he had ways about him to, to under, try to understand your motivation. And then, and, you know, I don't know, it's just, I don't know how you say it. Uh, I really listen. I really enjoyed talking to him and listening to him because he was a combat veteran. So he went to Vietnam. He, he couldn't hear out of one side of his ear because he lost his hearing in, in, a, in, a, in one of the battles, I guess, over in Vietnam. And uh, he was a great big old guy. Yeah, he had teeth that, because the side over here he got wounded on, I guess, they had to put false teeth in it, and he had some gold here, not gold, silver. But uh, I remember that. And I remember, just remember the guy, and he loved to drink. And uh, we always had a beer together. He took his NCOs out. We, we sat around and had a, had a drink. We kind of wind down, you know, and got to know us and stuff, you know, and he expected us to do a good job, you know, and he, he never talked about when I was in Vietnam. He never said anything about Vietnam. I learned it. I learned it through this book, this book here, this little catalog, and plus the other NCOs that knew him. But uh, he was quite a guy. Uh, and then, you know, I, I, I don't know whatever happened to him. 
I know he retired, but I don't know where, where he went. But I know he was he was a good E9, a good sergeant major. He was old-timey sergeant major. He's the one that taught me about the book, or talked to me about the book, keeping a record. A little record of. Yeah, your soldiers and stuff like that, because that's the way he was taught as an NCO. And he was amazed that I was doing it already. He said, who told you to do it? I said, I don't know. Well, I might have got it from the NCO Academy when I was in Germany. I don't remember, but I do that, you know. Right. Did um, Is there anything else that you'd like to tell us about that I've failed to bring out that we need to, that you'd like everybody to know about? Well, about your military I, experience. Well, about my military experience? Anything, yeah. Well, I, I know there's also other stuff that was in air defense artillery. We had quad 50s. Okay. That was not my error. That was Vietnam. Quad 50s was side by side guns that, you know. 50 cals. 50 cals. And then we had dusters. And the duster was that 40 mic mic that DeSantis was on. And those were, those were, the guys that served in those units were Vietnam vets. Uh, so air defense, and then we had Nike, uh, Nike Herc, uh, which was a missile system that was an old-timey system, but it was still a good system. They took Nike it. Hercules. Yeah, Nike yeah. Hercules. And I believe the Patriot missile system took its place. Uh, I never did, those missile systems I never did get involved in. Uh, I don't, the Patriot was higher than the Hawk, I guess you might say. I could have been, went into a Patriot unit. If I, you know, if they had assigned me to it. You did not serve in the first Iraqi war? No. I never, I never saw combat. Uh, I always trained for combat, but I never was afforded the opportunity to go to combat. Uh, I was trained for it. Uh, I know that uh, my last duty station in Germany with the Hawk unit, uh, we trained for it. That's why we were doing all that chemical stuff. I was telling you about wearing a Mop 4 unit. We were preparing for Iraq, for a war in Iraq. Uh, I think there was, I had about 10 MPs that were taken out of my unit. They were sent to Iraq. One of them, he actually captured 134 Iraqis. This is the first Iraqi war. They came in with their hands up. One was wearing, I love New York. On it. He had a T-shirt, I love New York, and he was wearing shoes like I got on. He was out in the battlefield fighting. But he, you just know, he had. a loafers. Yeah, he was just Iraqi. He was, yeah. but he gave up because, you know, they all gave up. They didn't want to do that. I guess. I know that uh, we bombed well, the Air Force. Thank God for the Air Force. They bombed them and bombed them and bombed them, and that just destroyed their morale because they had to stay. You know, if you were getting bombed 24-7, you can't get out and function. You can't even go to the bathroom you know, without thinking you're going to have a bomb, 500-pound bomb dropped on you. But they helped that war. That's what ended that war. Anything else you'd like to add? I appreciate you. Give me the opportunity to come and talk about myself. Well, Mr. Music, we appreciate you taking the time to come here yeah. and do this, and we really appreciate your service to the country. Thank you very much. Yeah.